to see so many black women in one building. Yeah. I feel like whenever we get together, I feel like it's like what the Lord says, with two or more are gathered, he is in the midst. Hey, <laughs> when hey. two or more black women, you are going to be fed. Hey. It's just naturally in our spirits to pour into each other. And I'm just excited to like receive some of that love and pour into others as well. Will this be your first natural hair expo? Absolutely, it will be, yes. Yeah. And um, do you claim to be a natural? I don't know, I'm on the fence about it. Okay. Because I wear protective styles. I've been natural since before it was cool, honestly. Um, because Just For Me perms did not work in my hair. I remember and that that. hot comb wasn't hot combing. I'm very, my skin is very sensitive. Um, and so it wasn't worth the pain for me to frizz up at the playground the next day. And I remember an experience like that. My mom took her time and straightened my hair out. I think it was like the right before third grade or something, second grade or something and straightened her hair out. We went to go see George in the Jungle and my uncle took me to the playground. It was a McDonald's, you know, the McDonald's playground where they had the two stacks. And honey, by the time I came back, my hair was like but was natural good. again. <laughs> so I've always been natural just because of that. And I really, um, but growing up in the South, it wasn't cool to be natural. You were you were nappy. It was a snap, crackle, pop. Like mm -hmm. I got so many jokes back on. So I got really good at like protective styles. Okay. I was a sew in, weave me down, um, braid me down, corn roll it. And I remember seeing like the few women, now I think about it as an adult, seeing the few girls who just wore their afros. Yeah. And I wish I had been that powerful to do it. Now I transitioned to becoming like a straight natural girl, like only my hair. Okay. Um, right as I entered the industry. Yeah. Because we moved to, I'm sorry, I'm going in. You asked me my no, question. No, I'm going in. Go but um, we moved to California, uh -huh. and unfortunately, we became homeless. My mother's job at the time snatched all of the money out of her account, claiming back payment. Ooh. And so there was no money to buy weaves or anything like that. And again, I tried to a texturize it at one point because, you know, the standard of beauty was, you know, the Christina, Christina Milian wet curl, or you were straightening it and blonding it at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember dyeing my hair like that orangey blonde. Like I tried to do it and I was like, it just does not work for me. And I tried to do the texturizer to do like the, the three C, you know, curl thing. And it didn't work. And I think the Lord was just like, girl, you better wear your hair as it comes out of your scalp. And you need to love you the way that I created you. Mm -hmm. And so around 17, 18, I became like supernatural. And I was like wearing my hair and the first role that I booked in the first couple of roles that I booked in the industry was just wearing my hair yeah. like in the church choir and playing a nurse and things like that. And you know, over the years you add extensions and things like that. And I got a protective style once a day, but I always make sure that it looks like the hair that's coming out of my scalp. That part, yeah. that part, that part. Cause you know, when you're doing acting, you gotta have your headshots and you want mm -hmm. your headshots to look like you're going to show up. Mm -hmm. And so I know that the, is it the Afro? Is it the Afro? Yeah. Well, yeah, I have the Afro headshots, and then I think prior, of course, I have my natural hair um, headshots as well, so that I can go in with either yeah. one, depending on the role. I'm like, okay, she might have a little shorter joint, a little TWA, yeah. so let me walk in with mine, or then with, with, with she's got the big, like the Angie moments, you know, yeah. I walk in with those ones, and then I think I have one natural, I have a, another headshot with just a little, like a little pixie cut, because I was in a pixie mood at the moment. But no. <laughs> now, at yeah. any point during your career, did you feel compelled to straighten your hair or to change up your look? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, that was honestly before I came in. My moments were, thankfully, I had it prior to getting into the industry so that I didn't have to deal with other people's outward projections on me. But I mean, it was the outward projections, but I didn't have to deal with um, by the time I got to the, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, I was already, you know, this is me. But I had my moments like 16, 17, and I think it was because of coming out of the South and not being the standard of beauty for the industry that I was going into and, and being a curvy, dark-skinned girl in the, South, in the South who's very eccentric and, again, mm -hmm. wearing natural hair. 
I got it. I got it hardcore. Like I got all of the names. So by the time I came out here, I was trying around 17, 18. I was trying to find myself with my hair. I did dye my hair orange, orangey blonde. Oh, <laughs> or, you know, it, it wasn't blonde. It was orangey because I did it myself. Because we, <laughs> we were broke, we were not going to the salons. <laughs> so I was doing it in the bathroom. <laughs> and this was like right before like YouTube was like all of YouTube. Did you use Kool Aid? I used Kool Aid, but I used Kool Aid with a red. <laughs> before so i've always kind of experimented with my hair and i think that's why by the time i got to the industry people couldn't really tell me anything mm -hmm. because like i've done all of the the trying to fit in mm -hmm. early because i didn't fit in early mm -hmm. so by the time i got to the industry where they say you have to be a certain thing i'm like oh but listen i have not heard that all my life people have told me i had to fit a certain place all my life and i don't care yeah. I'm going to do me. Yeah. And so I think that was helpful. I think God put me through the trenches early so that I could be able to stand on my own two feet by 18 and say, actually, no, I'm going to wear my hair natural. I'm going to be curvy and that's okay. And it's still beautiful and it's still sexy. And I'm still going to be a leading lady um, in spite of you saying that it's got to be bone straight. Love it. Love it. Love it. Now, speaking of the industry, yes. how important is it to have representation in the industry, to have Black and brown hairstylists and makeup artists that know how to work with your hair. Oh, that's everything. Because before, I mean, I've had so many experiences where people would argue me down on my complexion. Like they would do my makeup and I'm like, I actually don't, I look a little more yellow than I normally. And they're like, oh, it's the lighting. I'm like, no, I know. I've been with my skin at that time about <laughs> at least 20 something years. I know my skin in every lighting. This is not my complexion. And it's so important because there's just like nuances to our skin yeah. that I don't know if every other culture has, but I know there are yellow parts of my skin, there are darker parts of my skin, and that's something that you have to have an eye for. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just understanding how like the oil works <laughs> in our skin too. Like um, you put me, you put it on, it's gonna look matte one moment, but my skin oxidates, the makeup will oxidate. So I need you to be able to prepare for that, that it might get a little bit more glowy, mm -hmm. but also to just like to show specifically with hair, I think it's so important to show the complexities mm -hmm. and the variety of black women that I think other cultures might not have understand mm -hmm. or get that we switch our hair up. Like we don't always have the same hairstyle from week to week, day to day, depending on the woman, month to month. And you get a lot of experiences in the industry where people are scared to show that they're like, well, would she change her hair that quickly? Or we're, we don't actually know how to honestly facilitate that, a hair shift for someone with 4C hair mm -hmm. or who wears afros or anything like that. So there's a lot of times when I've been in the movie and I have the same look throughout the whole thing and I'm like well that's not really true to the experience of right. being a black woman specifically this woman that you're showing right. or that you've written but if you don't have a hairstylist who knows how to work with our hands or who knows how to touch our hair or who isn't afraid of it yeah that's a thing too some people are honestly they get um I don't know what's the word I'm looking for it's not afraid but they get out of the intimidated ah same thing you intimidated by it they see it and like oh that's something that I can't do so I'm not even going to try to do it at all I don't want to fail I don't want to look silly I don't want to ask dumb questions so I'm just not going to touch it at all and there's been times I've been on set and I'm just like one spray and then you're done or you know or like a little bit of foundation just a little bit of something and mm -hmm. you're done and i'm like well wait a minute i got cheeks too mm -hmm. i got eyes as well like okay. can we touch all of those things and i think it's just important to have someone who understands or is just not afraid of it yes and you actually asked answered my next question because i was going to say what does advocacy look like self-advocacy mm -hmm. and that looks like hey come back yeah, get these yes, cheeks. Yes. You know, get all of me. Absolutely. You know, yeah. not just a hairspray here and a hairspray there. Yeah. Like, like you know, like the other actors. Yeah. If anything, that's honestly something that I've been working on is like advocating for myself. Okay. I know I come off like very bold. I can't. Oh, you don't say. And I know I can, but I'm a little. I'm a little. I tell people I'm a deer. I am. I'm like. Huh? And then it will bounce to the next very quickly. So learn. And then I also feel like, well, one, it comes from the upbringing of like you won't fight everybody mm. like everybody's gonna have some say you're gonna fight everybody so i got very quiet easy good at being quiet all right and like silencing myself 
Or you're not trying to be the angry black woman. That too, because my name is Shaniqua, you know, and I'm already curvy and I come in da da da. So honestly, the moment I say anything, it's already, or, why are you so sassy or anything like that? And I'm like, but actually, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm just stating the same thing that she's saying, but the timbre of my voice is a little deeper. Mm-hmm. So it's coming off like that, or you are you're receiving it that way, not coming off. You're receiving it that way because you're not used to a woman like me standing up for themselves. Or if, and I honestly feel like they put that again. The angry black woman has a tactic to silence us, right? You know. So I'm learning how to have leaning more into having uncomfortable conversations mm-hmm. because I would run away from them in the past. Okay, uncomfortable yeah. conversations. Let's yeah. talk about that. So, right. one uncomfortable conversation around our hair, we're trying to ban that, right? Mm-hmm. And we're trying to ban that with the Crown Act. Yeah. We're trying to eliminate the barriers in the workplace to say that you can be, you know, discriminated against for having locks, Come you know, on. and wear those locks in the crown, and and yeah. having, you know, our, our big natural hair as we choose to wear it. Uh, what are your thoughts around the Crown Act and why do you feel it's needed? Yeah, well, I think it's absolutely needed to protect women from honestly being banned or stopped from opportunities where the way their hair grows out of their scalp. But also, I think it's just the way enough of to just control us, to diminish our creativity. I think there's like so much fear about an empowered black person. Mm-hmm. Because, and it's that down to like them not even us not even uh, being allowed to be proud. We're just in like these last couple of years being like, okay, actually we are allowed to be black and proud and it's not mine being proud of my blackness is not a a comment on your whiteness at all. And I feel like um, with that, because we are so creative with our hairstyles Mm -hmm. and we are able to switch it up and, and do so many things, it's just another way to be like, let me harness all of that creativity. Let me harness that individuality. Let me get them to become more, more like us, and to a form and, and reform to what what's the societal or the beauty American norm. Mm-hmm. But there's actually nothing wrong with that hair that grows out of your scalp. Yeah. And the fact that we can be banned or penalized or kicked out of school or have to miss prom because of the way that our hair naturally grows out of our scalp is insane. And the fact that they're still trying to remove history from schools. At, while this is still going on, just, just a very clear example or evidence to me that we are going to repeat our history. We are going, America is going to keep doing the same repetitive thing if we continue to erase what's already there. If you're not going to learn, allow children to learn about it, how do we create change? Deep, 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 deep. So um, you have a platform as an yeah. actress. You have this beautiful role in a beautiful series, yeah. Harlem. And with that, you know, with chasing our dreams and, and securing them also comes big responsibility to speak on mm. natural hair, to speak on the things that are important to you. Yeah. So tell me how are you using that platform? Well, I believe more so than the platform that I'm the platform that my body is. And I really think that my like biggest desire in this industry is to use this black body to use this curvy, dark skin, 4 c hair body to put myself in as many situations on screen that we aren't allowed to see black women in. Yes, but you don't feel like stunted at any point knowing that like, well, my mom can only go as far as she can go when, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a white woman can get me into white spaces. Yeah, I understand. And I've honestly, I've done the agent and manager thing and I may even at some point, if I find the right, correct person, might do it again. But I don't ever feel like, honestly, I'm getting to a place where I'm realizing that, well, one, what God has for you is for you, okay? And can nobody, no one can take that away from you. But a lot of the opportunities that we feel like we need a white person to get us in the door for, a lot of times they, it's just like we paying them to talk to their friends. Mm-hmm. Like you're paying them so much of your money mm-hmm. to do something that literally takes one day for them. And it's like, so I have to sign a lifetime contract. You're gonna get money from everything I do for one phone call from your friends while you pretty much just sit and chill for the rest of it. And that's what I don't want. It's like, I would rather have somebody who is working for me that I know is going to give me all, all the time and the effort that I need and actually 
advocate for me and open doors and do some of the grunt work that's required, go to these functions and things versus someone that's gonna sit on their butt, make one phone call and that's it. And that's it. I think, I, I don't know, I think I'm in between like, do I wanna just to go the longer route or do it for myself and then I get to keep my money and have ownership? Yeah. Or do I wanna, you know, sign with somebody and not be sure that I'm getting all that I'm paying for? Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing in the industry. You never know what you're, what all of the work that they're doing, you have to like sneak in here conversations that were, or like let them speak. And, and then in, in the truth telling, you can kind of like deduct from the pieces and be like, okay, this is what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. you know? And so those, that's been my experience. And so right now, I'm honestly, I'm just like breathing and deciding what the next thing is for me and creating the next spaces for me and getting the foundation stuff done. And then um, we'll see. I'm saying if we go back into the agent, the, the shark tank. Oh, <laughs> the shark tank. Like, yeah. like, yeah. What are your thoughts around the Crown Act? Um, the Crown Act is a necessity, an unfortunate necessity, because. because the thought of someone being punished or having to move, lose out on schooling, education, prom, and things yeah. like that because of the way their hair naturally grows out of their scalps is just insane to me. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that our hair could be policed mm. right. is nuts, honestly. Um, I think it does not deter from your work, your work ethic, right. you as a character. I think, honestly, it's just a beautiful form of expression and allows someone to show more of their individuality. But unfortunately, in this country, we don't want black people to be as empowered. Um, as be it to be as individual individual as possible they want us to conform that's always been the goal for the for the US is to get um, black Americans to conform to a certain way of living and only live by that standard mm -hmm. and so as we become more empowered as we are expressing more black pride I think it's honestly having a little bit of backlash in, in politics and but I'm grateful mm -hmm. that we are still fighting for ourselves and advocating for ourselves and um yeah i think it's just it's um, it's really really sad it's really it really breaks my heart that people can say that you can't get this or you can't get this job opportunity or even though you're more than qualified or you have to lose out on this education even though i've done this i've been at school all this time but unfortunately i have to be suspended there was a black girl suspended mm -hmm. for having an afro for the way her hair naturally grows out of her scalp so um, let's push the Crown Act, and I believe, is it, what's the newest, uh, I guess the biggest update on it, has it been um, accepted and passed yet? So at the state level, since you know each state did it at the yeah. state level, it was passed. Good. Um, at the federal level, I believe it was passed. Okay. So it's time we get into the finish Yes, line. amen, because <laughs> I have a dream we can show up the way we want to. It's hair. Yes, yes, yes. It really is just hair. Speaking of showing up, tomorrow we're showing up to the Twin Cities Natural yes. Hair Expo. What are you most looking forward to? Black women, honey. <laughs> I cannot wait to see all the black women because when we get together, it's just, it's magic. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a cliche, but it is. Black women are some of the most just loving, support. it's why everybody, whenever they got a problem, they run a black women because we are some of the most loving, supportive, vivacious, joyous, creative beings on this planet. So when you get us in a room, honey, I know I'm about to be poured into and I cannot wait to pour into others and learn some new techniques about hair, but more so just smile into black women's faces. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanna do. <laughs> Where do you go to hair and natural products? Ooh, okay, so right now I am loving as I am. Cause my scalp, it, it, it I can get, real dandruffy <laughs> telling my business but i can get an itch i can it grows a lot um and so this is my not, not this is a hair but it does i just cut my hair off recently and it, it'll, it grows very quickly and in the midst of the growing and dandruff will start happening and so i love that anti-itch that good old peppermint i think they have is the blue one and i also love that double butter because it just gets the hair feeling so soft 
and I'm really good with just an old school as far as like a like a spritz. I love some olive oil with some water and a little bit of whatever conditioner is around. I'll just shake that thing up in a water bottle and just spritz myself. I was just about to ask that. Is there any like home remedies that yes, you have tried? Yes, I love olive oil loves my hair. It really does. So I'll put some olive oil like my skin too. It just don't smell good. So if I could, I would put I would bathe myself in olive oil because it it really does do wonders on my skin and my hair. But it does not you smell like a whole salad. The whole you really do. But yeah, we pour I pour some um, olive oil in just like a little spray bottle with some water and whatever extra like you know when you got a little bit left of remnants of conditioner, but it's not enough to like really do anything. I just throw it in there and just shake it up, and that become my spritz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love you. Thank you. And I love you as Angie and the hit Amazon Prime series Harlem. Yeah. We got so much to talk about. First of all. You're working with the Megan Good, yes. And I and I read the book because I read. I do my reading and my watch. Actually, I watched it, yeah. but it sounds better to say read. But I watched read in the interview that so you true. said that you were a huge fan of Megan Good, yes. And now you're working with her. I know. What is like? How do you keep yourself from being like? It blows my mind. It really, it really does. Sometimes there's moments where it just feels unreal. Like the first time I heard her read at the table read, and we had all gotten the scripts maybe like the day of or the night before. This is like season one, because we know that thing is that thing right now. Yeah, but uh, we had just gotten the scripts and they just wanted to hear it for thoughts and things. And she reads and it's like water. Mm -hmm. Like it's just so effortless and effortless and effortlessness, effortless. Effortless. That's it. Effortless. Why does it sound weird when I say it right now? Maybe because I'm tired. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. But she reads and it's just effortless. It really is. And I know there's so much work because you talk, you hear her speak about her process and the thoughts and the um, decisions she makes. And it's no, it's, it's definitely effort and thought put behind it. But she just, it's because she's been doing it so long. It just, it's really like butter. It's so beautiful to watch her act. And I pray that she like gets all that she deserves because that woman acts a face off like her dramatic moments are just as for what we know her more so for her dram dramatic stuff but her dramatic moments are full and depthful and then her comedic moments are hilarious like she's honestly one of the most so funny and quick and improvises and everything so i just want everything that god has for this woman to come to her because she's also one of the most kind human beings mm -hmm. i've ever met in my life and so supportive. I'm recently um, going into this new adventure, which is music. And she is directing, she directed my first music video. And honestly, because of just love and kindness and support, she could, she's directing an episode of Harlem. She could do anything in the world. And I sent her my first song just out of like, I really thought it was, I would just get notes or something. I, she had said before, whatever, if you want me to direct it, I'll direct it for you. But I thought, you know, like, making good she'd probably be like sis i'll catch you on the next one you know what i mean but she's like what should, whatever you want me we're gonna do it let's get it done and she has really been so supportive and, and instrumental in pushing me to do this because i'm very fearful mm. about music um i think i've always ran to the art to the arts as honestly a place to run and find, at first it was to hide yeah. and now it's become a way to discover mm. and to represent and um, with music ain't no hiding. Mm. It is you. And so, okay, it is your soul. If you are not acting in that on in the studio, it sounds like it, you know? Mm. And so, to be able to have this incredible, you know, acting experience that's been so pivotal in my career with someone who's been my hero, like literally studied her monologues in college, and now also being able to experience this incredible moment in music with her. I'm just like, God is amazing. So I'm living in a prayer. Okay. So you went to school for this? Mm-hmm. Okay, where yeah. did you go? Where did you go I went for? to the American Musical Dramatic Academy. I went to the musical theater. And um, because I knew I wanted to act and I always wanted to sing, even if it, and the musicals have always been my escapism so it's my favorite movies are musicals it's what's love got to do with it it's five heartbeats it's baz lerman's romeo and juliet i just love i feel like music is the highest form of communication mm -hmm. and there's something so powerful with visual arts and visual mediums um 
it's the reason why we think, you know, about that all angels are white is because they're painted on the Sistine Chapel, you know, or they're painted in, you know, in all of these, all of the stories we or visuals we've ever seen of anyone angelic is white. So the reason why we think everything of power or beauty or spirituality is white mm -hmm. is because of the visual. And so to combine the visual medium and then also music, which is just, you can forget your own phone number, but remember a song that you hate. <laughs> You know, really and truly, when a, a song that plays on the radio, they that um, well, I don't hate old time old. Old time old is my joint, okay? okay. But still, like when there's songs that can just be embedded in your DNA, and I don't know why. Like I can remember all of the words to to Tussie Roll, and I ain't heard that in forever. But I just feel like it's something about music that just latches onto our spirits, and to be able to combine visual medium and music, I really want to use that to empower and tell some stories that we haven't been able and, and create roles that we haven't been able to see black women do before. Really use it to shift culture if I can. Okay. Yeah. So two things. What is the role like what is your dream role? My dream role is anything I create. <laughs> that is the dream role. The dream role is to be the creator. Mm -hmm. That's the dream role. Because then I have, um, I, I know that the images I'm putting out are going to be ones to expand the imaginary fields that we have on black women and or, or black play and black love and black expression. I really want to be a part of just opening those barriers because we aren't exist, able to exist in the future, really, or in the past unless, unless it's under like a very, very small scope. So my dream role would be able to create as many options, as many opportunities for other black people mm -hmm. to tell their stories and allow black people to play. Yeah, to play. Yeah, Very to nice. play. We got a lot of stories of oppression. I want to see us play. Okay, what does that look like? To me, it's being chosen, it's being loved, it's being in fantasies, it's flying and being in the future, I want to see us run from aliens, and I love that's what I love so much about Nope. I just want to see us allowed to be allowed to uh, to play in the creativity that cinema like um, has, and I feel like because the people who are in control of cinema only see us in a narrow gaze, which is as supporting help as helpers mm -hmm. to them, we are only seen as helpers on screen or on thugs on screen. And so I would love to no longer be a helper mm -hmm. or be a criminal mm -hmm. and allowed to be just straight main characters all the time. Yeah. So yeah, that's my that's for me. And you talked about in a previous interview that what you love about your role, Angie, mm -hmm. is that you get to see a bold, mm -hmm. you know, fierce yeah. black woman in a lead role and not just in a role that's facade. Mm -hmm. The light skin. Mm -hmm. How is Shaniqua different and the same from Angie? Oh, well, Shaniqua is, um, there's a lot of things that I'm learning from Angie. So I will say the ways that we are different is that Angie advocates for herself completely and utterly and sometimes even when it's not necessarily needing to be heard. <laughs> But her her level of self advocacy is where I would love mine to be. Um, I also think she is much bolder than I am. I can like outwardly present that way, but I'm actually like super shy. But Angie don't care. She will tell you exactly what she thinks and how she thinks. And I think Angie to me is like a mirror. Like whoever is around her, you can't help but to see yourself because she's gonna tell you what yourself is. And I think it's mainly because she's very honest with her own self and where she is and and those parts of her that aren't in, in love with where she is at the time it hurts it does she wants to be where she where she desires she sees herself as a selling out a tour selling you know billboard artist and she hasn't made it to that yet but she doesn't let her circumstances define who she is and that's another thing that I think I, I've definitely learned from Angie is like her amount of self love is endless. Be it on her friend's couch or in a penthouse, Angie is a princess. She is a queen. 
no matter where. And I think, honestly, that might be something that we have in common because I've always been kind of a princess too. Like even we, I grew up in the projects and not saying that the way that you feel about yourself is defined by um, your material things, but even in the projects, I always would go to the most expensive things in the store. Not on purpose, wouldn't even know it. But I'm like, what's that? And they're like, that's ten thousand dollars. Like, um, uh, uh. um, so always had a heart and a desire for what I knew I wanted, what I knew I was worthy of. Even if my circumstances didn't define it, I knew I was going to be in a mansion. I knew I was going to have a private jet. I knew I was going to be a superstar, even in living in Richmond, Virginia, and having the few people that do did come out of Richmond at the time was not claiming it, you know. So not really having the the, I guess the um, examples of the lavish or, or the levels of like um, entertainment success that I wanted. I knew that it was meant for me. And that's a determination and a complete and utter like law of self that I do have in common with Angie. I know what I want. And I think Angie knows exactly what she wants as well for herself in life. Um, and I also think there are parts of me um, that do lean into her. Like she would be, she's very fun and I pull the fun from my family and myself as well. So there's a little bit of quirks from Shaniqua that I put in there, put in Angie. I have to break the law right there and talk to Angie. Oh. And be like, why don't you just take a job then? Listen, she did take a job. She settled into Get Out even when she did not want to do it. Well, she knew true. Get Out was BS. A musical version of an oppressed film, it was like, no. She knew it was beneath her, but she still went and did it because she does have a desire to get off of her friend's couch. And not only did she do get out, she went and became some, became somebody's nanny to do it as well. And she had two jobs in that season and no one pays attention to it because she a black woman, because <laughs> she a dark skinned woman. We don't respect our, our pregnant. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. Speaking of which, what can we expect from Angie in season two? I think we can expect Angie to deal with the repercussions of her desires. I think we see her really chasing a dream in season one and it not pan out in the way that she wanted in season two. She's dealing with the repercussions of that, mm. of this dream that she's been having for so long, not necessarily being coming to forward in this avenue with Get Out. Yeah. Okay, so. Angie is a superstar yes, she in her mind. mind. Yes. But the woman that plays Angie, like, it's just not a play mm -hmm. of being a superstar. Like, you a superstar for real. Thank you. You sing. You act. You dance. I'm, I'm a good chair dancer. <laughs> now, listen, you don't understand. I will cut it up in the chair. Hey. But ask me to stand on my two feet. I'm like, wait a minute. Which one is left? Which one is right? <laughs> okay. well, yeah, I dance in my mind. You did, and you sing too, like Beyonce in the shower. Oh, uh, in the shower, I think I sound like Beyonce. I get out of the shower sometimes, it don't work. But you know what? I'm working on sounding like Shaniqua. Okay. Well, let's hear a little bit of Shaniqua. It's your birthday. It's my birthday. And I know you like karaoke. Let's do it. So we're going to do a little karaoke. Is that all right? I would love to do some karaoke. All right. Let's do a hype song, though. It's my birthday. I don't want to do no sad songs. Okay, let's be hype. Oh, yeah.
Something about you just Gives me butterflies 